Yo, what is up, you guys? Welcome back to Small Talk Sports, episode 16. And wow, we're really moving quite along. It's a bit of a sweet 16 over here, too, because it's the sweetest time of the year. We have the NBA Finals. We have the French Open. We even have the Stanley Cup Finals for all you hockey nerds. Uh, we got the Vegas Golden Knights and the Florida Panthers. I know nothing about hockey, as some of you may know, but I love Vegas. I got a lot of family there. Shout out to my cousin. Shout out to Bubby. I know you're watching. Also, I really don't like the Florida Panthers. They beat my Hurricanes, man. Not my Hurricanes, but my friend really likes the Hurricanes. And, you know, I got a vendetta now. But we have a jam-packed show today. Game one of the NBA Finals happened a couple hours ago. A lot of French Open talk today. And look at this Drake, Drizzy Drake, you may know him. Drake put over $1 million on the Nuggets to not only win the finals, but to win in five games. So we're going to see if the Drake curse is in effect. But Nuggets took game one last night. You know what? Let's just jump right into it. Cue that transition music. The NBA Finals are finally upon us. We've been waiting all season long, all calendar year long for this time. You see Nikola Jokic wiping away tears as they're announcing players. It really made everything feel real. You know, you're, it's marked off in your calendar. And then finally, we're here. It's the excitement of basketball. But with risk of sounding like an NBA on TNT commercial, let's just move right along to what happened. The Denver Nuggets beat the Miami Heat 104 to 93 to take game one. Although the game was not as close as the score would suggest, the Heat made a little mini run in the fourth quarter. Too little, too late. If they played like they did in the fourth quarter for four quarters, then the Heat would probably have no problem taking that game, which is why, all right, drum roll please, the Heat are my pick to win the 2023 NBA Finals. I know, I know, I also watched game one, I know, um, but I have the Heat winning in six. I have counted out Jimmy Butler specifically, but I've counted out the Heat this entire postseason, and it's finally time to punch my ticket onto this hype train, okay? I think they should have beat the Celtics in six games. I think Tyler Hero coming back, potentially for game two, is going to be a huge boost for them, a 20-point-per-game boost. They're the best three-point shooting team in the postseason with the Nuggets at a very close second. Still the best, nonetheless. And if the Heat really want to win this series, and if they want to win it for me to get my prediction right, they got to stop Jamal Murray. They have to find a way to stop Jokic. They don't really match up well against Jokic, although Bam Adebayo played an incredible game for Game 1. But either contain Jokic or just worry about everyone else on the court and come to terms that there's no stopping the two-time Taco Bell MVP. But look, since the first play-in game when they lost against the Hawks, when, if you remember the Heat losing all the way back in April, we've been counting them out. I Look, I'm not going to say we. I have been counting out the Miami Heat. They just continue to prove me and us wrong. But I think it's finally time for Jimmy Butler's ring. I think Jimmy Butler actually deserves this ring more than Nikola Jokic. The teams around them are completely different. The Nuggets are extremely deep, and they're a little scary if you're looking down that roster, whereas the Heat have seven undrafted guys, and they're just being carried by the very fibers of Jimmy Butler, just his fingernails reaching to the end to will them all the way here to the finals, and they're there, and there's just no way Jimmy Butler loses this game. I think in terms of legacy, Jimmy Butler's 33 years old. Nikola Jokic is 28, although he plays like he's a 42-year-old at the park. But I think Jimmy Butler needs this ring. Jokic is going to get another chance at his ring in his career. Again, he's 28. Jimmy Butler, I think this window is closed shut if he does not win it this year. And I think that that fire is really just going to drive him forward. Um, I got the heat in six. I need to stick by that. Again, the Nuggets looked really, really good, really deep today. But watch out for the heat. And Tyler Hero, too. I'm a hero hater. Maybe that'll change by the end of this playoff series, but let's see what happens. This, this has been the most unconventional NBA season from day one all the way to now with the different storylines, all the twists and turns. Um, this script, if you will, is very, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to feed into the script stuff. I think it's dumb. But look, I'm going with the Heat in six games. I'm going with Jimmy Butler. I trust him with my life at this point. Okay, but before we do close the page on this, I do have to give a shout out to Contavious Caldwell Pope. He just has a knack for beating the Heat in the finals. I thought that was worth mentioning. Of course, you remember from the 2020 bubble year with the Lakers that 
a lot of people like to discredit, and I like to fight those people at airports. But Contavious Caldwell Pope, keep doing your thing, man. If Denver does end up winning this series, there's only one guy I want to see get that finals MVP award. That's you, KCP. All right, let's keep it moving and go on to the French Open. How about that? Round three of the French Open is underway. We are in full swing here in clay court season. Over at Roland Garros, the paradise that it is over in France, there are a couple of upsets already in these early rounds. Yannick Sinner was upset by Daniel Altmaier in a match that lasted five hours and 26 minutes. All right, more on that later. Well, I guess more on the court that housed that match later. Francis Tiafa moves on, and if you guys remember correctly, his most recent major win was in Houston, and that had a clay court, if we remember that whole episode. So maybe he makes a little run here at Roland Garros. But speaking of that Houston Open, Tomas Echeverry was Francis Tiafo's opponent over there in the finals of the Houston Open. He also moves on to round three. Taylor Fritz had an exciting match over Arthur Rinderkinesh. He was the last remaining Frenchman over here at the French Open. Is at that same court that Yannick Sinner was upset at. It was a little rowdy over there at court Suzanne Leglin last night. And you guys tell me, if you've been following tennis longer than I have, if a player leaving after the third set for about seven minutes, is that normal? Is that normal for someone to do? Um, because I know that when I was watching that Heat Nuggets game, if the Heat just took seven minutes to come out after halftime, it definitely wouldn't be a normal thing. But this Arthur Rinderkinesh did that against Taylor Fritz, and I was, I was so lost. And the announcers were like, oh, yeah, this is pretty normal. This happens all the time. I guess he did it in round one also. Um, it was a little strange for me. The fans were super into it. They started singing to Arthur uh, when he came back for set number four and he won that first game. But the fans were not on Taylor Fritz's side. And you know what? Honestly, I think it was bad enough to be our beef of the week. Let's just jump right into it. So I guess formally this week's beef of the week would be Taylor Fritz versus the fans over at court Suzanne Leglin. And look, Taylor Fritz is 25, Arthur's 27. Maybe we have a little rivalry brewing, but it was actually a little bit ridiculous. Um, and I know France doesn't have too much to cheer for after the World Cup. Shout out to Argentina. Um, as we know, France lost that in one of the most thrilling sporting events I'd ever seen. But Mbappe didn't deserve it. France didn't deserve it. That's, again, whole other podcast. And side note, I really should start a series every time I say, oh, that's for another podcast and just kind of save those up. You know, maybe that can be another uh, Small Talk Shorts episode. Maybe it could be a different offshoot. We'll get into it. So set three, Taylor Fritz loses the first set. He wins the next two. And then after this set three, Taylor Fritz is serving and he's just out there all alone. Arthur Rinderkinesh is nowhere to be found. Uh, Fritz is getting some warm-up serves in and you know, we talked about this seven minute delay. It was just as weird to see on the actual broadcast. They had a little timer graphic out saying how long the wait had been for Rinder Kinesh, which again, any other sport, ridiculous. Show me a team sport. Let, let's say that. Show me a team sport where someone could just wait it out because they don't feel like it. Um, I know in baseball, sometimes they'll do those wacky uh, dugout staring contests before the games. Well, I guess not really a staring contest, but you'll have a member of each team outside the dugout, and whoever doesn't want to go back first wins, or I guess loses. No, win. Okay. Before I further confuse myself, now the crowd was really in on Arthur Rinder Kinesh. They started serenading him after he wins that first game. Talked about it before our beef of the week. And anytime Taylor Fritz would miss a first serve, the crowd would go crazy. And I was baffled. Like, that's just really not good sportsmanship by the French. I was kind of on Taylor Fritz's side here. I'd also never heard of Arthur Rinder Kinesh before today. So I guess I was a little biased towards Taylor Fritz, who I'm a fan of. Cameraman Harry is a big fan of. The crowd was also doing this tactic, which I thought was clever, but I didn't like. They would fake shush each other, but just keep it going well into Fritz trying to serve. So the umpire would say, Melsi, Melsi, please, shh. And then the crowd would all go, shh. But an elongated shush to where it's like, oh, they're not trying to be quiet. They're just trying to 
continually make noise so Fritz couldn't concentrate. Maybe if I was in Fritz's position, if I'm playing over at North Hollywood Park and fans are doing this to me, my first question, why are there so many people watching me play tennis? My second question is how the heck did Taylor Fritz keep his composure in this moment and go on to win the match? I was so happy for him. And then he did maybe the coldest thing I've ever seen in the game of tennis. He gets his final point, he gets that final swing, and he starts shushing the crowd like he's at an NBA game, and he just hit a buzzer beater. It was ruthless. The crowd hated it because of course they would. I loved it. He then blew them kisses. It was a top three Taylor Fritz moment I have ever seen. It's going to go down in history. The crowd wanted to have the last laugh in the post-game interview. They kept booing and making noise so that the interviewer would have to be delayed in talking to Taylor Fritz. And his response was, they cheered so well for me. I wanted to make sure I didn't lose. All right, thanks, guys. And he walked off, and it was phenomenal. I, I think it was just the perfect amount of boundary pushing from Fritz where it wasn't too arrogant. It wasn't too much. But it was completely in his wheelhouse to be doing that. Again, the fans were not super nice to him. I get it. It's the French Open. It's the last Frenchman. Their team lost the World Cup in a super embarrassing way. But look, I kind of love Taylor Fritz a lot more for it. And just between us, every time I've said Taylor Fritz, my mind is just so used to saying Taylor Swift that maybe I'll include one of the bloopers. I've said Taylor Swift too many times for my own liking on this podcast. Well, there you have it from the French Open, and there you have it from Taylor Fritz. I, he is definitely climbing that ladder quickly of my favorite tennis players. Um, he's definitely top, I'll give him top five. Uh, yeah, okay, Taylor Fritz, I'm giving top five. And just one more thing about the French Open while I'm here. I think ESPN and the way they have tennis on their application is horrible. Like the fact that I have to Google French Open and it gives me a more in-depth analysis than anything on ESPN, it's a little troubling for me as a sports fan. Again, we can talk about that later. You know, if you're still watching the podcast at this point, thank you so much. If you've made it to the end of the episode, or even if you followed from episode 1 to 16 with the shorts in the middle, or if it's your first episode, hey, welcome. Thank you so much. And we're just going to keep pumping this out. The support only makes me want to go harder and do more and make this the best it can be. And I really see it as us being on this journey together. So welcome. Welcome aboard the ship. And next stop, episode 17, unless I have an idea for a short before 17. But you'll know that before I do. See you later. Small Talk Sports. After the two players switch sides, Taylor Swift is 